thank you, Amy. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Paul Reeve. Paul received his bachelor's degree and master's degree in history here at BYU and a PhD in history from the University of Utah. He taught at Southern Virginia University from 2002 until 2005. And since that time, he's been an assistant and an associate professor of history at the University of Utah. He received the Smith Pettit Best First Book Award from the Mormon History Association for his book, Making Space on the Western Frontier. He's received uh, other awards, including the J. Talmadge Jones Award of Excellence from the Mormon History Association and the Ramona W. Cannon Award for Teaching Excellence from the University of Utah. He received a faculty fellowship at the University of Utah. He's uh, the former associate chair in the history department and the current director of graduate studies. At the University of Utah, Paul teaches courses on Utah history, Mormon history, and the history of the U.S. West. He serves on the board of editors of the Utah Historical Quarterly and was a past board member of the Mormon History Association and the Faculty Advisory Council uh, for the University of Utah Press. He'll be speaking today on uh, his recent book, Religion of a Different Color, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness, which was published by Oxford University Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Reeve. Thank you, Brian, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Brian and Brendan and Ignacio and Amy Carlin at the Red Center. It's a privilege and honor to be here uh, and to talk to you about my research from, from this book. Uh, been doing research over the last seven years and kind of grown accustomed to the blank stares and skeptical looks when I tell people, especially the subtitle of the book, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness, uh, especially in the 19th century, people's perception, Mormons are just white, but uh, even in the 20th and 21st century, so what was the struggle about? What I'd like to do today is hopefully give you uh, information and evidence to uh, substantiate the claim that there was a struggle for whiteness and help us to then rethink the Mormon racial story. So I'd like to start with the political cartoon that I selected for the cover for the book. It was published in Life magazine in April of 1904. And the title or the caption that goes with the political cartoon is simply Mormon Elderberry out with his six-year-olds who take after their mothers. So if you look at the political cartoon, you can obviously read all kinds of messages into this. But um, I think one of the messages is simply in the minds of outsiders, polygamy is not merely destroying the traditional family, it's destroying the white race. And uh, Life magazine in 1904, I think, is attempting to trap Mormonism in a racially suspect past at the same time that Mormonism is attempting to transition into a white and pure future. The timing of this political cartoon is no coincidence. Joseph F. Smith, who is the leader of Mormonism, has just returned from a withering six days on the U.S. Senate witness stand in the Reed Smoot hearings. Reed Smoot was a sitting LDS apostle who was elected by the Utah State Legislature to serve in the United States Senate. The Senate was concerned about having a LDS apostle as one of its members and uh, conducted a three-year long investigation into whether or not they would allow Reed Smoot to retain his Senate seat. But that investigation uh, put on trial not just Reed Smoot, but the entire LDS church. And uh, the leader of Mormonism, Joseph F. Smith, was subpoenaed to testify. He was asked about the continuing practice of plural marriage amongst the Mormons, as well as Mormon disloyalty to the nation. He returned from his testimony, and on April 6, 1904, at General Conference, issues what historians refer to as the Second Manifesto. We really are giving up polygamy. We mean it this time. And he announced that any future Mormon who would take an additional plural wife would be subject to church disciplinary action and excommunication, a policy that the LDS church practices to the present. So uh, 
this is, I think, a part of Mormonism's effort at transitioning to a white and pure future. We're talking about marriage. What you have to understand is that marriage was racialized in the 19th century. Monogamy was defined as the preserve of the white race. And polygamy was seen as uh, the preserve of Asiatic or African societies. The Supreme Court actually makes this point in its 1879 decision on polygamy. So uh, what you see then in Life Magazine's political cartoon is an effort, I think, of trapping Mormonism in this racially suspect past, suggesting that it facilitates race mixing. If you understand how much Americans fear race mixing in the 19th century, they're projecting that fear onto the Mormons. Most states in the nation have laws against two or three of the supposed or imagined marriages of Mormon elderberry. And it's no stretch of the imagination to then see Mormon Elderberry himself as a caricature of Joseph F. Smith. The long flowing beard was picked up by uh, a variety of cartoonists during the time period and emphasized, uh, and I think it's just a caricature of Joseph F. Smith here. So with that as an introduction, let me uh, develop uh, some of the, the information or the evidence that I want to share with you today. And uh, two big ideas to keep in mind as we progress through our discussion today that sort of shape uh, the events that unfold across the course of the 19th century. In the 19th century, uh, this development theory was in operation. Uh, people argued that societies all develop uh, along this basic trajectory, from savagery to barbarism, and then from barbarism to civilization. And as they move along this trajectory, they leave behind the markers of barbarism or savagery. Some of those markers were seen as adherence to despotic rule and polygamy. The Anglo-Saxons were seen as the best evidence of this. They march across Europe to occupy Britain and then from Britain across the Atlantic to the New World and they establish a, a democratic form of government. Uh, and they were seen as then the preserves of liberty, whiteness equal liberty. The first uh, US Congress, 1790, establishes what it means to be a citizen, to naturalize as a citizen, and you had to be free and white to qualify. So whiteness uh, was seen, or Anglo-Saxons in particular, were seen as people who had gone through these uh, stages from savagery to barbarism and from barbarism finally to civilization. With the Mormons, you have ostensibly white people out there in the Great Basin who are doing things that white people are not supposed to do, giving their free will over to the despots Brigham Young and Joseph Smith and practicing polygamy. So the fear is not just that you have a racially suspect group of people, excuse me, a religiously suspect group of people, but in fact that you have a deterioration away from civilization backward into barbarism and savagery. And so in the minds of outsiders, it's not just a suspect religious group, but a suspect racial group, and American democracy is at stake. So you have to keep that big idea in mind as we progress through our discussion today. The other thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, in the 21st century, uh, race is, is seen as a social construct, something that we've sort of imagined in our minds. And one way in which we've sort of imagined race, uh, or the way that race plays out, especially in uh, the 19th century, is something both ascribed from the outside, what outsiders try to project onto a given group, and in this case the Mormons, a racial identity, and then something aspired to from within. So what, what, what we will see is that outsiders attempt to project a racially suspect identity onto the Mormons in the 19th century, and the Mormons from within attempt to claim their own racial identity, uh, claim whiteness for themselves. And one way that you claim whiteness for yourself in the 19th century is in distance from blackness. And you'll see Mormonism moving across the course of the 19th century away from their own black converts towards whiteness. And to the point that by the beginning of the 20th century, you have a race-based priesthood and temple restriction uh, in place in Mormonism. So let me uh, then give you the evidence to support these claims. So I'll start out with Dr. Robert Bartholo. He was a medical doctor sent west with Johnson's army in what we call Utah War. In 1860, he files a report with the United States Senate as he's leaving Utah. 
And in this report, he talks about um, a degraded Mormon body that is emerging from the marital practices of the Mormons. He says, the Mormon of all the human animals now walking this globe is the most curious in every relation. Mormonism is a great social blunder, he says, which seriously affected the physical stamina and mental health of its adherents. Polygamy for him was the central issue. He said that it created a preponderance of female births because you have one man marrying all these women. He suggests then that the offspring are going to be predominantly female. He said that it also uh, created a high infant mortality, that the offspring of Mormons uh, or, or Mormon polygamy in particular were sickly and therefore subject to uh, higher rates of death. And he said it creates a striking uniformity in facial expression, which included albuminous and gelatinous types of constitution and physical conformation among the younger Mormons. No idea what uh, albuminous and gelatinous types of constitution actually means, but that's what the good doctor argued. And he goes on to argue that polygamy is in fact giving rise to a new race. An expression of countenance and a style of feature which may be styled the Mormon expression in style. An expression compounded of sensuality, cunning, suspicion, and smirking self-conceit. The yellow sunken cadaverous visage, look around the room, the greenish colored eyes, the thick protuberant lips, the low forehead, the light yellowish hair, and the lank angular person constitute an appearance so characteristic of the new race, the production of polygamy, as to distinguish them at a glance. You can tell a Mormon when you see one. Okay, polygamy is giving rise to a degraded, deformed body. The degradation of the mother follows that of the child, he says, and physical degeneracy is not a remote consequence of moral depravity. So that's just one example of the ways in which outsiders look in on Mormons and ascribe a racial identity to them. Polygamy in the minds of outsiders is giving rise to a degenerate, deformed race. By the end of 1860, there's a conference at the New Orleans Academy of Sciences on the Mormon body. And all of the doctors who gather uh, by Bartholomew's argument and push it forward, except for one who suggests that it's only 30 years that Mormonism has been around. It's too early to argue that a new race is emerging in the Great Basin. We should observe it systematically for at least another 30 years before we firmly conclude that polygamy is giving rise to a new race. So um, Mormons are very much aware of the way in which outsiders are defining their bodies as degraded and deformed. And you see then from the inside this aspiration. Uh, the argument from the inside is simply that polygamy uh, was sanctioned by God and therefore the offspring will be angelic, celestial, and divine instead of deformed and degraded. Just some examples from the 19th century. Uh, Mary Jean Mount Tanner, a plural wife in 1880, recorded, there are no healthier or better developed children than those born in polygamy. Plural marriage was a principle established by revelation for the regeneration of mankind, she says. George Q. Cannon in 1882 contended that the children of our system are brighter, stronger, and healthier in every way than those of the monogamic system. Other Mormons claim that plural marriages produced a more perfect type of manhood, mentally and physically, and a fine, healthy race. So neither side sort of contesting that polygamy could produce something different. They're just contesting the out outcome. One suggesting it's going to be degraded and deformed, and the other angelic, celestial, and divine. So how does this then impact the racial priesthood and temporal restrictions? So what I'd like to do is then just establish that uh, during the first couple of decades of Mormonism, Mormonism uh, creates a very inclusive racial vision. This Mormon gospel message is for all people according to the way thinkers of Mormon, uh, Mormon thinkers on the inside articulate their vision in the first couple of decades. You could start with just the Book of Mormon itself in 1830. Uh, it declared that all are alike unto God, including black and white. If you place that within a very charged 1830s racial context, you have to understand that's a radical racial vision for a country that sees black and white uh, should be separated, black people should be marginalized and even enslaved. Uh, just other evidence, William W. Phelps uh, 
publishes an article in Jackson County, Missouri in the Evening and Morning Star in 1833 entitled Free People of Color. He says, so long as we have no special rule in the church as to people of color, let prudence guide. He's simply publishing this article as an invitation to Black Latter-day Saints to gather with the rest of the saints to Jackson County, Missouri, the place that's been defined as Zion. But then he publishes two sections of the Missouri legal code. If you are a, a free black Mormon and you're going to immigrate to Zion, you need to be aware that Missouri is a slave state and they have laws establishing your ability to move freely in this state. You need to have papers that substantiate that you are a free black person. If you don't, you'll be subject to being whipped and driven from the state. So be warned by fellow black Latter-day Saints, he says. You can immigrate to Zion, but make sure you're aware of the Missouri legal code. This is enough to start the process of the Mormon expulsion from Jackson County. Outsiders read this same column and they say Mormons are inviting freed blacks to the state of Missouri to incite a slave rebellion. And not just incite a slave rebellion, but to steal our white wives and daughters. The fear of race mixing there from almost the beginning in Mormonism. And uh, Phelps' uh, newspaper will be destroyed, his press will be scattered in the streets, his uh, printing office and home will be destroyed, and the bishop and another man will be hauled into the town square and tarred and feathered, and that's the beginning of the Mormon expulsion from Jackson County, Missouri. Other evidence then of this inclusive racial vision. Uh, Phelps again in the Latter-day Saint Messenger and Advocate in 1835. All the families of the earth should get redemption in Christ Jesus, regardless of whether they are descendants of Sham, Ham, or Japheth. And like most religious people in the 19th century, Mormons, including Phelps, viewed uh, the racial divisions uh, across the globe as descending from Noah's sons after the flood. So Shem for the Asians, Ham for the Africans, and Japheth for the Europeans. Uh, and yet they are all, they should all be brought into the gospel fold according to Phelps's vision here. All people were one in Christ Jesus, whether it was in Africa, Asia, or Europe, he says. Uh, and these kind of open racial attitudes uh, continue through the Nauvoo period. In an article published in the Times and Seasons, uh, the saints in Nauvoo uh, envisioned people, quote, from every land and from every nation, the polished European, the degraded Hottentot, and the shivering Laplander flowing to that city. And then they also included an open racial vision in terms of their attitude for temple admission. The saints at Nauvoo anticipated persons of all languages and of every tongue and of every color who shall with us worship the Lord of hosts in his holy temple and offer up their horizons in his sanctuary. And we can even go as late as 1847 with Brigham Young, establishing and articulating an open racial vision. 1847 at winter quarters, Brigham Young is interviewing a black Mormon named William McCary, who is married to a white Mormon named Lucy Stanton. McCary is complaining about the treatment that he has received at the hands of fellow Latter-day Saints. And he says it's because of his, ra his race that he is being treated unfairly amongst the Latter-day Saints. And so there's an interview with Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve in Winter Quarters. And Brigham Young articulates an open racial vision in 1847. He tells William McCary, it's nothing to do with the blood, for of one blood has God made all flesh. He's paraphrasing Acts 17.26, a common verse used by religious people in the 19th century to argue against the polygenesis theory that some scientists were putting forward. The races are so distinct that they must have originated from separate creations or polygenesis. And religious people in the 19th century argued against that idea, and they would frequently uh, cite uh, Acts 17.26 as their evidence of this. And Joseph Smith and Brigham Young here in 1847 both refer to that verse uh, talking about all of us being descended from uh, God and, and his children, all, uh, all of us are of one blood. And when William McCary continues to uh, complain, uh, saying that he doesn't have any position of authority in Mormonism, Brigham Young will then cite a black priesthood holder in the Lowell, Massachusetts branch as evidence that Mormonism is open in terms of its racial attitude uh, towards the priesthood. So he says, we have one of the best elders, an African in Lowell, a barber. 
He says this to William McCary as William McCary is arguing that he's being treated differently because of uh, his race. And Brigham Young is referring then favorably to Q. Walker Lewis, a black man who has been ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood in the Lowell, Massachusetts branch. And Brigham Young is aware of Q. Walker Lewis, aware that he is black, and aware that he holds the priesthood, and cites him uh, favorably to Q. Walker Lewis. So he's on record in favor of black priesthood ordination in 1847. And when uh, William McCary persists, uh, Brigham Young will come back and say, look, William McCary, we don't care about the color. We don't care about the color. So even Brigham Young then on record up through 1847 uh, with an open racial attitude. So how does Mormonism's open racial attitude look from the outside? So I've just pulled some examples from the book then to demonstrate then from the outside looking in, outsiders are fearful that Mormons are accepting people that the rest of American society suggests should be segregated and marginalized. So Mormons accept all nations and colors is one accusation leveled against them. Mormon elders maintain communion with the Indians and walked out with colored women was one charge leveled against missionaries preaching in the South. Mormons welcomed all classes and characters into their society. These accusations are not celebrations of Mormon diversity, you have to understand, okay? Mormons included aliens by birth and people from different parts of the world as members of God's earthly family. Mormons honored the natural equality of mankind without accepting the native Indians or the African race. They're including Indians and Africans in their vision of racial equality. The Mormons opened an asylum for rogues and vagabonds and freed blacks was one complaint coming out of Missouri. And one uh, additional complaint out of Missouri, Mormons pr promoted black ascendancy over the whites, even suggesting that black, black should be ascendant over the whites. And then, um, as additional evidence then, uh, Edward Strutt Abdi, who was a British official on tour of the United States in the 1830s, comes across a copy of the Book of Mormon, and he reads it. He returns back to England and writes a three-volume book about his tour of the United States. And in this three-volume book, uh, he describes his encounter with this new book of scripture. And he says, uh, he comes across this passage, all are alike unto God, including black and white, and he says, wow, that is such a radically different vision of racial equality in America, it's going to get this new religious sect in trouble. The Book of Mormon ideal that all are alike unto God, including black and white, made it unlikely, excuse me, that the saints would remain unmolested in the state of Missouri, Abdi predicts, and he proves to be uh, accurate in that prediction. So these kind of accusations continue across the course of the 19th century and get picked up in political cartoons. 1872, Brigham Young is brought up on charges of lascivious conduct uh, relating to his plural marriages and he's hauled off to court. And this becomes popular fodder in the national press. Frank Leslie's Budget of Fun, a pictorial magazine published in New York City, imagines what the scene must have looked like as Brigham Young's family uh, watches him being hauled off to court. So so the cartoon is simply titled, Affecting Parting of Brigham Young from His Interesting Little Family. Now what's so interesting about the family is the interracial nature of the family. The first wife reaching out to Young here is a stereotypical black mammy from the plantation south. This is uh, what southern whites before the Civil War liked to imagine their black mammies to be like, uh, that they were happy. They were so well cared for that they were fat and contented and so ugly that no self-respecting Southern white would have sex with them as cover for the interracial rape that was taking place on plantations throughout the South, let alone marry them. But when you throw the black mammy into Brigham Young's family, then he's doing something that no self-respecting Southern white would do, that is have sex with the black mammy and marry her. And then you can see uh, Another wife is black, a couple of children are black, and even some of the white wives are racialized as well. In the 19th century, political cartoonists uh, liked to portray Irish immigrants with simian or ape-like features, suggesting that they were more ape-like than they were white. And in this political cartoon, they're projecting that same fear onto the Mormons. So Brigham Young's interesting little family is interracial and giving rise to interracial 
degradation in this depiction. 1870, John Sherwood's A Comic History of the United States is published, and uh, it includes this illustration, a Mormon family out for a walk. You have the enfeebled patriarch out front, the long string of wives that follow behind, and then the seemingly endless stream of children. But once again, it's not just the number of wives and children that is so interesting here, but the interracial nature of the family. Another stereotypical black mammy from the plantation south, an Asian wife, and a Native American or Pacific Islander wife. The fear, once again, Mormonism is not just destroying the traditional family, but destroying the white race. Most of the political cartoons and illustrations that I came across included the white male and then the interracial women. Uh, some of them, however, will reverse course, uh, as in this example, Alfred Trumbull's The Mysteries of Mormonism, published in 1882, included this illustration, simply titled A Colored Mormon. You see in this illustration, the colored Mormon is black and the wives are white. This is uh, the post-reconstruction period in America. Uh, federal troops have been withdrawn from the American South and white Southerners are reasserting racial supremacy. And if you are a black man in the South, you can be lynched simply for looking at a white woman wrong. And Southerners create this myth of the black beast rapist. Black men just simply want white women. And they're projecting that fear of the black beast rapist onto Mormons here. Mormons allow what uh, the rest of America knows uh, should be forbidden. And it continues up through the turn of the century, 1905, Saul Bloom's publishing house in New York publishes uh, The Mormon Coon. Uh, it's a, a sheet music um, performed on Broadway. And it was a part of a musical genre called coon songs that were popular from the 1880s through the 1920s. Uh, they racially denigrated African Americans in these coon songs, but in this particular case, uh, they conflate Mormons and African Americans in their denigration. Uh, and the chorus for the Mormon coon goes like this. I've got a big brunette and a blonde to pet. I've got them short, fat, thin, and tall. I've got a Cuban gal and a Zulu pal. They come in bunches when I call, and that's not all. I've got them pretty too, got a homely few. Got a, I've got them black to octoroon. I can spare six or eight. Shall I ship them by freight? For I am the Mormon coon. So across the course then of the 19th century, you see a persistent theme that uh, outsiders believe Mormonism facilitates race mixing and thereby giving rise to racial decline in America and making it unfit for democratic rule. So what sort of impact does this have on the inside? Um, across the course of the same 19th century then, you see a deterioration away from that open racial vision of the first couple of decades of Mormonism towards segregated uh, priesthood and temples by the beginning of the 20th century. And I think it begins in 1847. So Brigham Young on record in March of 1847 as uh, favorably aware of a black priesthood holder in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, William Appleby, a convert to Mormonism, uh, for seven years and in 1847 appointed to survey the condition of the branches on the east coast of the United States. Remember the main body of saints are in the process of leaving the United States and moving to northern Mexico in 1847. William Appleby is supposed to then survey the condition of the branches on the east coast, see what uh, the saints are, are like and how they're living up to uh, their religion. By his own account, he says he travels 2,000 miles during that year, and one of the branches he visits is the Low Massachusetts branch, the same branch Brigham Young referred to in March of 1847 as containing a black priesthood holder, Q. Walker Lewis. William Appleby is not aware that Q. Walker Lewis is in the Low Massachusetts branch and encounters him in his visit there and is surprised to learn that Mormonism has a black priesthood holder. Much more disturbing to William Appleby is the fact that Q. Q. Walker Lewis's son, Enoch Lewis, also a black Mormon, is married to a white Mormon, Mary Webster, in the Low Massachusetts branch. He's been a Mormon for seven years. Do we allow this? 
in Mormonism, he wonders. And he writes a letter to Brigham Young asking that very question. Now, dear brother, I wish to know if this is the order of God or tolerated in this church, i.e. to ordain Negroes to the priesthood and allow amalgamation. Amalgamation is the pre-Civil War term for race mixing, okay, borrowed from metallurgy. If it is, I desire to know it, as I have yet got to learn it. And Brigham Young, remember, on the way to the Great Basin, so he doesn't receive this letter uh, until he returns to Winter Quarters. And uh, back at Winter Quarters, remember, he comes to the Great Basin, uh, helps to establish the saints in the Salt Lake Valley, and then returns to Winter Quarters. And he will meet William Appleby in person on the 3rd of December, 1847, and learn firsthand of William Appleby's report of Enoch Lewis being married to Mary Webster in the Low Massachusetts branch. And unfortunately, this is uh, recorded as a, about a four-hour meeting. Uh, there are other members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles who are present. Uh, we have 13 lines of minutes from this four-hour meeting. So it's really difficult to know the full extent of the conversation that took place, but the minutes that remain are all centered on notions of race mixing. And Brigham Young speaks out strongly against race mixing in this meeting, actually argues for capital punishment as the penalty for race mixing. And uh, then we have Brigham Young making his first open articulation of a race-based priesthood restriction on the 23rd of January, 1852, to the Utah Territorial Legislature in relationship to a bill that the legislature is debating that session, deciding how they will govern the black slaves who have been brought to Utah Territory by their white masters who have converted to Mormonism from the South and some of those black saves have converted to Mormonism as well. Uh, what laws will govern that relationship in Utah Territory? And the debate takes place in the territorial legislature. Brigham Young will uh, first articulate then his race-based priesthood restriction in that context. His most forceful articulation will come on the 5th of February, 1852, uh, and is really in a response to Orson Pratt. Uh, in the process of researching for this book, um, uncovered some speeches that had never been transcribed from Pittman shorthand from the 1852 Territorial Legislature. So we know now that Orson Pratt, who is an apostle legislator, is debating with Brigham Young, prophet governor, uh, in this legislative session. And uh, Pratt doesn't want this servant code to be passed. And he speaks out strongly against it, and in fact moves that the servant code be rejected in its entirety. And in the process of his speech, he argues that only God administered divine curses and that they were particular to a given time and place. Brigham Young argues that the priesthood restriction is based upon the curse of Cain. That is the only rationale he will ever use. He never resorts to the Book of Mormon, never resorts to the Book of Abraham. He is consistent in one reason for the priesthood restriction, Cain killed Abel, and as a result, all of Abel's descendants will have to receive the priesthood first before any of Cain's descendants, and Brigham Young understood Cain's descendants to be black people. And he argues for the curse of Cain, and that is the only position he will ever stake out. That's the only rationale he will offer, and it's based upon the Bible and the curse of Cain. Okay, an idea that predates Mormonism by at least a thousand years. And Brigham Young is picking up on that idea and then giving it theological weight in his argument in the territorial legislature. So Pratt is pushing back and saying, uh, God may curse a, a, a people, but it doesn't pass down. It's not multi-generational. Okay, it doesn't pass down from generation to generation. He says, shall we take then the innocent African that has committed no sin and damn him to slavery and bondage without receiving any authority from heaven to do so? He found the idea preposterous, and he said it was enough to cause the angels in heaven to blush. Uh, Pratt and Brigham Young will debate again on the 4th of February. Uh, Pratt will give another speech, unfortunately not recorded. We know that he gives a speech because Brigham Young's speech on the 4th of February is recorded, and Brigham Young gets up and says, no one got up to speak until Pratt got up to speak, and he only got up to speak to push his thumb into me, okay, to get his digs into me. 
We do know then that the next day, Brigham Young, the 5th of February, will give his most forceful articulation of a race-based priesthood restriction. Black people will not rule over me in Utah Territory, he says, in relationship to the fact that Orson Pratt was arguing for black suffrage in Utah Territory. They were debating the election bill. And Orson Pratt argues that black, people, black men should be allowed to vote in Utah Territory. Brigham Young says they will not rule over me in Utah Territory, and they will not rule over me in this church. Okay, uh, and Orson Pratt pushes back again because that afternoon they debate a couple of innocuous municipal bills, the incorporation of a Cedar City and Fillmore, and Orson Pratt votes against both of those bills, and he says he does so because they prevent black people from voting in their ordinances. And that's his pushback again against Brigham Young after Brigham Young gives his uh, strongest speech on the race-based priesthood restriction on the 5th of February. So what does this mean then in the lives of black Latter-day Saints? Uh, we'll just take the case of Elijah Abel. Elijah Abel is a black man ordained an elder on the 3rd of March, 1836, sanctioned by Joseph Smith, Jr. Uh, there's a certificate signed by Joseph Smith uh, certifying that Abel has been ordained an elder. I don't know who ordains him an elder. Joseph Smith is aware in March of 1836 that he's been ordained an elder, and the certificate is a certificate of his standing as uh, a minister of the gospel in Mormonism, and it uh, uh, says that he is an ordained elder in the Mormon gospel. He is later that year ordained a member of the Third Quorum of the Seventy on the 20th of December by a man by the name of Zebedee Coltrane. Uh, he receives his Washington anointing ritual in the Kirtland Temple. That's as far as the temple uh, experience had been developed to that point. In Nauvoo, he does baptisms for deceased ancestors and friends. Then he moves to Cincinnati by the time the endowment ceremony is introduced in Nauvoo. So I don't know what would have happened had he been there. Uh, there is a belated remembrance then in the 1850s that he applies to Brigham Young for his temple endowment to be sold to his wife and is told no. I don't find that in the written record. If that took place, it may have taken place in person. What does enter the written record is his application in 1879 to Brigham Young's successor, John Taylor. Elijah Abel asked to be sold to his wife and to receive his endowment. This will open up an investigation. So as late as 1879, if this race-based priesthood restriction is unambiguously in place, why does a leader of Mormonism need to conduct an investigation? Certainly, they are not ordaining, actively ordaining black men to the priesthood, but John Taylor is not sure what to do about this black man who holds the priesthood and is asking for the remaining uh, ordinances in the temple. Joseph F. Smith, who was an apostle at the time, is sent to interview Abel. Abel produces his priesthood certificates. Joseph F. Smith returns back to the meeting and reports that I saw the certificates myself. The decision of the meeting is that uh, priest, uh, Elijah Abel's priesthood will be allowed to stand, but he will not be admitted into the temple to receive his endowment and to be sold to his wife. So the lone surviving black priesthood holder is used to then begin the formulation of a race-based temple restriction. Elijah Abel will go on a third mission for Mormonism and will return to the Great Basin in 1884 and will die uh, from exhaustion a couple of weeks later. His obituary is printed in the Deseret News. I don't know who wrote it, but whoever wrote it is aware of the shrinking space for Black Latter-day Saints and Mormonism by this point. It's not your typical eulogy. It simply is a recitation of his priesthood certificate dates. And it simply concludes, he labored successfully in Canada and also performed a mission in the United States from which he returned about two weeks ago. He died in full faith of the gospel. There are a variety of letters that uh, LDS leaders respond to uh, between the meeting in 1879 over Elijah Abel's case and 1908 when I think the last brick in this priesthood restriction and temple restriction are, are finally in, pro in place. Uh, by 1907, the LDS First Presidency will arrive at a one-drop policy in application to temple and priesthood admission. This fits within a broader national context. Remember, 1896, the Supreme Court of the United States puts its stamp of approval on separate but equal. Southerners remember reasserting white supremacy. 
Northerners joining in in that process and segregating most aspects of American life. And many states in the nation will pass increasingly stringent legal definitions of how you determine someone is black or white. And some of those states, like Virginia, will adopt a one-drop policy. So the one-drop policy simply means if you have one drop of black ancestry, you are legally defined as black. You can have 100 white ancestors and one black ancestor. And the one drop rule simply means legally in the state of Virginia you would be black. Mormonism adopts its own one drop policy in 1907. The descendants of Ham, understood to be black people, may receive baptism and confirmation, but no one known to have in his veins Negro blood. It matters not how remote a degree, there's the one drop clause, can either have the priesthood in any degree or the blessings of the temple of God, no matter how otherwise worthy he may be. The decision is not based on worthiness. You're basing it simply upon skin color so that a black person and a white person could answer all the temple recommend questions and the black person would be excluded from admission into the temple, rec in, in, into the temple based upon the skin color, not based upon worthiness. Okay. So that one drop policy then put in place in 1907. And I think the last um, brick in this um, race-based priesthood and temple restriction is finally in place in 1908 in another meeting that takes place. This time it's in response to a letter from the mission president in South Africa. We just baptized a Zulu chief. He wants to take the Mormon message to the rest of his group. What do we do about this? And the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve meet and try to decide what to do in this case. And what we see taking place then by 1908 is sort of uh, the leader of Mormonism, Joseph F. Smith, the deterioration of his memory over time. So think back then to 1879. In 1879, he interviewed Elijah Abel and saw his priesthood certificate and came back to that investigation and defended Abel's priesthood as valid. In 1895, uh, in another meeting about race and priesthood, he reminded LDS leaders that Abel was ordained to the priesthood at Kirtland under the direction of the prophet Joseph Smith. Then in 1904, we start to see the slippage take place. In uh, another response to a racial case, uh, Joseph F. Smith says uh, he calls Elijah Abel's ordination a mistake that was never corrected. 1908 then, in the response to this letter from the mission president from South Africa, Joseph F. Smith claims that Abel's priesthood ordination was declare, declared null and void by the prophet Joseph Smith himself. And so now you are erasing from collective Mormon memory the black priesthood holders that complicate the white story. And you are claiming whiteness for yourself as you distance yourself from blackness. And I believe that's the last brick in place. Um, you're erasing from collective Mormon memory the black priesthood holders and suggesting that the priesthood and temple restrictions had always been in place. They were there from the beginning. God put them in place, and it will take a revelation to get rid of them. And in fact, it does take a revelation to get rid of them 70 years later. Uh, at the same meeting then, uh, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve decide, uh, also remember the other part of the question was, well the Zulu chief wants to take the gospel message to his group. What do we do about it? They decided that missionaries, quote, should not take the initiative in proselyting among the Negro people, but if Negroes or people tainted with Negro blood apply for baptism themselves, they might be admitted to church membership in the understanding that nothing further can be done for them. So contrast that with the picture I uh, created of the universal open attitude of this gospel message in the first couple of decades of Mormonism, and you see then the shrinking space for black Latter-day Saints across the course of the 19th century to the point that you have this priesthood and temple restriction in place by the beginning of the 20th century. And Mormonism is then passing as white. And so successful are they at passing as white that by the time Mitt Romney runs for the presidency in 2008 and 2012, you have the exact opposite charge being leveled against Mormons, that they are in fact too white. 
you have a political blogger in 2008 who gets a hold of the Romney Christmas card uh, and photoshops a black man into the very white Romney Mormon family and then makes fun. The Romney Christmas card, he says, represents the melting pot that is Utah. Who do you think is the non-Romney or nominee in this photo, he asks. And then in 2012, when Romney does secure the Republican nomination, remember that Lee Siegel in the New York Times publishes an editorial calling Romney the whitest white man to run for president in recent memory even though all of our presidents have been white up through Barack Obama. Romney is somehow the whitest of the whites as a result of his Mormonism. So in the 19th century then, Mormonism denigrated as not white enough by the 21st century as too white. In the 19th century, they move away from blackness towards whiteness as an effort at claiming that white uh, identity for themselves. And by the 21st century, I think an effort to try to claim a more racially diverse and international identity for Mormonism witnessed the I'm a Mormon media campaign. And before she decided to run for the US Congress, Mia Love was one of the faces in that I'm a Mormon media campaign featured with her white husband and interracial children. Very stark contrast from Brigham Young's reaction to the news of Enoch Lewis's marriage to Mary Webster in the Low Massachusetts branch in 1847. So from not white enough to too white is the overarching arc of my argument here. Thank you very much. I think um, okay to take some questions. Yeah, in the back. Do we know of other black besides Elijah Abel? Yeah, so Elijah Abel and Q. Walker Lewis, uh, the one that Brigham Young refers to favorably in 1847, are the most well documented. Um, others have suggested that there are other uh, black men who are ordained to the priesthood. Um, I'm on the fence in some of those cases simply because the documentation isn't strong enough. The first documented black person to join Mormonism is 1830 in Kirtland, Ohio, a man by the name of Black Pete. Some have suggested he was uh, ordained to the priesthood. Haven't seen enough evidence one way or the other. He may have been. He may have been. Uh, but Kirtland, 1838, and other possibilities. The problem is uh, the evidence just isn't strong enough. So I go with the two most solid cases, but suggest that there are maybe a handful of others that may have been ordained to the priesthood in the first couple of decades. Yeah. What parallels do you see with women's role in the Mormon church? Uh, do you feel like that coincided with this kind of the movement towards whiteness was a movement towards, um, I don't know, national acceptance and other domains. Um, you know, um, in terms of um, women's roles, uh, Utah was well ahead of the rest of the nation, uh, granting women uh, the right to vote. Uh, you have uh, one of the longest running uh, feminist magazines being published by Plural Wives, the women's exponent. Uh, so, you know, um, in some counts would have seen out of step and yet the outside perception is that they are simply um, white slaves. That's another theme that comes through in the political cartoons that Mormon women are white slaves in the 19th century trapped in a system against their will even though they speak out against that. Um, so, you know, um, is there a parallel to, to women's roles? More often than not I get the question in terms of the way that this plays out currently um, in terms of arguments for female ordination in Mormonism in, in the present. Um, so I think there are perhaps some parallels there, but there are also some distinctions. Uh, the number one distinction is uh, obviously that there is a precedent for black priesthood ordination uh, in the 19th century, and I've not seen a precedent uh, for female ordination in the 19th century. And black people are the only uh, group of people in Mormonism that uh, are not allowed all saving 
ordinances simply because of the color of their skin. So women invited into the endowment, um, even if we suggest that uh, Smith is borrowing from masonry in creating the endowment ceremony, masons don't allow women, Smith immediately invites women in to the endowment ceremony. Uh, and uh, all of these saving ordinances uh, that Mormonism requires are open to women uh, and blacks were restricted from the ordinances that their faith said was necessary for salvation. And it's the only group that that is, is true for. And so in some counts, you know, there may be some parallels, but also I think some important distinctions. Yeah. Uh, was race mixing going on in the 19th century Jewish communities in the So you do have then Enoch Lewis marrying Mary Webster in the Low Massachusetts branch. You do have William McCary marrying Lucy Stanton, um, you know, Nauvoo and Winter Quarters, uh, a couple of other incidents. But obviously, uh, Brigham Young is speaking out really strongly. An outsider is not aware of the way in uh, uh, the stance that Brigham Young is staking out. Um, he will return to his notion of capital punishment in a speech in Utah Territory. Um, it's never put into uh, Utah law or encoded in any sort of way is sort of typical Brigham Young bombast, but nonetheless, he's very uh, vehement against the notion of race mixing. Uh, so there are a smattering of, of examples um, for black-white race mixing, but uh, the preaching from the pulpit is stridently against it. Uh, the other distinction that we should make is that um, the preaching about uh, white Native American race mixing is very different. Uh, Mormons are being encouraged to take Native American wives. So very different racial trajectory there. But for black whites, yeah, there are a handful. Um, if you're going to figure it out, the one drop rule, so some of the letters arriving at uh, LDS headquarters the last part of the 20th, or excuse me, 19th century, um, I believe so-and-so has black ancestry somewhere back then. If I marry him or her, uh, will my priesthood be null and void? You know, those are the kind of questions. What do you do with when you have suspicion of black ancestry? Um, so not a large number, but yeah, a few cases. Yeah. Back there. Um, Mormon race is a racial theology with a contributing factor in the rejection of what archaeologists are discovering by the United Africa and the or do you think that would be yeah, I'm not aware that that's uh, playing a factor. I've not seen evidence to, to su uh, suggest that that's the case. Yeah. Was there a question here? Yeah. I wanted to understand the logic that uh, some uh, mixed race marriages was okay and others won't. What other races would they allow to marry? And what was the, the logic that you can marry this one? Yeah, so. Uh, uh, theologically, then, the, the argument goes that uh, Mormons have a vision of Native Americans as fallen descendants of ancient Israel. Uh, and they, they tap into the Book of Mormon narrative to explain who uh, they believe Native Americans are. And they see their interaction with Native Americans as a part of Native American racial uplift and marrying into and amongst Native Americans they see as a part of that racial uplift, it will make them, quote unquote, white and delightsome. And Brigham Young is explicit on that point as he sends missionaries amongst the Native Americans and says that's a part of the racial uplift. Uh, for African Americans, the fear is that it will go the opposite direction. So in his 1852 speech to the territorial legislature, he says if we all marry, he says all of our white legislators were to marry amongst uh, black people, it will bring the curse of God upon us and the church will be destroyed. Uh, so very different notions of what intermarriage means. Uh, playing out more broadly, Broadly, um, it, most states in the nation have laws against black-white race mixing in the 19th century. Some Native American tribes pass laws against their tribal members marrying blacks. Um, it's this racial ladder, right? And your position on that racial ladder is determined in part, at least, in distance from blackness as it plays out in the 19th century. And so you even see Native American groups passing laws against their members uh, intermarrying with black people. Uh, Utah never passes a law against white Native American intermarriage. They do pass a law. Uh, against uh, white Asian intermarriage, which is also taking place in the 19th century as well. I 
the reason I was, I was thinking more on the line when I think about Polynesians or Japanese or Chinese or other races and how they think I'm sure. Yeah, they do. Um, so it depends on, uh, in some of those kind of cases, uh, who the judge is presiding. So in, in the Utah experience, you have Mormon converts from Hawaii who are gathering to the Great Basin uh, and uh, ask for naturalization. And the judge sees them as more votes in the Mormon column. And so he defines them as Mongolian or Asiatic and says not capable then of becoming naturalized citizen because you have to be white to be a naturalized citizen. So it doesn't allow them to be naturalized so that they can't vote. And it gets caught up in you know the Utah um, experience of the struggle for Mormon votes versus non-Mormon votes in the territory. Uh, that's one example and it plays out in various locations elsewhere. Obviously a variety of states pass laws against white Asian intermixing. Uh, initially, Chinese was the term used, and then more broadly, they say, well, we need to include all Asians. And so the term used in the legal codes, for example, in, in Nevada, California, they'll use Mongolian. Uh, and in the 19th century, that was the language used to, to mean Asian. So not just Chinese, but Japanese, any person from Asia uh, would be defined in that term legally uh, preventing their race mixing. And Utah adopts that in 1888 as well. Actually late in terms of Western states, um, but nonetheless joins the trend in 1888. Yeah. Have you uh, experienced any uh, pushback or, or resistance from the LDS Church when you suggest that the, uh, you know, the Mormon prophets and the infallibility of the Mormon prophets, uh, Brigham Young and Joseph F. Smith, to their points of view on uh, on racism? And, you know, how do you, how do you with that? Um, well, I was invited to BYU to speak. Um, <laughs> in the Joseph F. Smith building. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, invited by the LDS Church History Department uh, to come and give a presentation very similar to this. Um, not surprised there. Um, I, I have uh, a lot of friends um, in the Joseph Smith Papers and, and uh, you know, employed in the Church History Department. The real surprise came when I was invited by the Public Affairs Department um, uh, to come and give a presentation and had a very lively conversation. And in fact, um, they have told me they have bought copies of my book to give to um, people. And so that's as much as I know, like no one above that level. I've, I've had a couple of members of the 70s say, I have your book, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, right? <laughs> Um, but you know, I think I think uh, maybe we're sort of in a different um, period, and you have the race and the priesthood essay, um, and you know, sort of maybe a different kind of attitude and different kind of willingness to grapple with those notions of fallibility. Um, a part of the conversation at the um, at, at the public affairs department did center on what I presented to you about Joseph F. Smith, sort of memory deteriorating over time, right? Um, and wanting to kind of figure out what that all means. But um, it was an open group and several of them had read it. They invited me. <laughs> um, I didn't ask to go down. So it was an invitation from one director who had read the book and said, you need to come and present this to us. And since that point, um, when they have racial issues that come up, they've called and, and uh, asked me to consult with them on, on different uh, situations. So. Maybe I'm overly optimistic, but it's been uh, good so far. Um, the BYU bookstore carries the book, I understand, but um, squirrels it away in the world's um, religion section. <laughs> so if you can work on that. Um. <laughs> I'm curious what you think of, or what you think of the, the way that the, the gendered way the restriction is characterized. Yeah, right, you know, seven statement, and then even in the, the gospel topic state, calling it race and priesthood, um, when in fact policy restricted men and women, right, from temple ordinances. So to link it exclusively to priesthood, does that sort of minimize its scope? Well, I, I definitely think it minimizes its scope, and I try to be very careful um, in the book and, and when I present that this impacted black women. 
right? And we don't frequently. It's the forgotten part of the narrative. It is the forgotten part of the narrative. And I try to articulate it as a uh, priesthood and temple restriction that included black women, right? Um, uh, women not being ordained to the priesthood, but nonetheless um, being prevented from temple ordinances, all those saving rituals that are required in Mormonism. And in the book I deal with Jane Manning James, I didn't in my presentation here, but obviously she is making her case for admission into the temple and is consistently told no. And the resort is once again to the curse of Cain uh, in her rejection. And so yes, it definitely impacts black women as well. And it is um, a disservice to only refer to it as, as a priesthood restriction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that I, the debate that was happening in the, between Brigham Young and was it Orson Pratt? It is Orson Pratt. Um, uh -huh. And he was ad Orson Pratt was advocating uh, black suffrage. Was he alone in that opinion? Basically, how far did that ever get, if at all? Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't get very far, and um, he's the only person that we can find in the territorial legislature arguing for black suffrage. Uh, but once again, unfortunately, um, you know, even his 4th of February speech is not recorded, and I would love to know what he said, <laughs> because I think Brigham Young's 5th of February speech is directly in response to Orson Pratt. And when Brigham Young on the 5th of February says, if no other prophet ever said it before, I say so now, black people are cursed um, from the priesthood. I hear him saying that in response to Orson Pratt on 4th of February. No other prophet has ever said this before. How can you say this? And I hear Brigham Young saying on the 5th of February, if no one has ever said it before, I am saying it now. And it is, I think, further substantiation that Brigham Young is striking out on his own. That he is differentiating himself because he says so in that 5th of February speech. Um, but in terms of black suffrage, uh, the legislative record is really sparse. Uh, like I said, uh, uncovered some speeches that had never been transcribed. The LES Church History Department uh, transcribed them from Pittman Shorthand, allowed me to use them um, gratefully. Uh, so added additional information, but no other record of anyone voting in terms of black suffrage other than Orson Pratt. Yeah. Um, how do you interpret this research? Do you view this policy as revelation or perhaps a product of a racialized society or making them both in your opinion? So, you know, you're asking me then to sort of put on a different hat from the academic to the believing Mormon. Uh, how do I sort of navigate this for myself? I don't believe that this was a revelation. Um, that's, that's my personal um, take on it. Um, I'm a practicing Latter-day Saint. I don't believe that this was a revelation. Um, I, I kind of use uh, a speech that um, President Benson gave as an apostle in 1976. He articulated uh, what he called the Samuel Principle. Uh, and he's referring to uh, the Old Testament. He says, well, you know, the children of Israel in the Old Testament uh, wanted a king. And uh, God said no, and they continued to insist on a king to fit in. <laughs> and um, this, uh, God says to Samuel, well, uh, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Give them a king. And President Benson says, sometimes God, within certain bounds, gives us what we want and then lets us suffer the consequence. And I think he gave Brigham Young what he wanted and let us all, including and especially white Latter-day Saints, suffer the consequences. The consequences of feelings of white superiority, the consequences of, um, you know, this lingering priesthood restriction and curses of Cain and the impact that we bring upon our fellow black Latter-day Saints. Those are all consequences bound up in this. And um, that's how I make sense of it for myself. I'm not saying anyone else has to make sense of it that way. That's the way that I make sense of it. Um, so I, I don't see it um, as, as a revelation. There's no canonized revelation that begins it. There's a canonized revelation that ends it. That's the only revelation in the Mormon canon on race, priesthood, and temples. And it's an open racial vision that returns Mormonism to its original open roots uh, in its first couple of decades, in my estimation. Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. Do you think some of our emphasis on the traditional family has to do with um, accusations of polygamy destroying the traditional family and some of the, the history? 
Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, um, you know, one of the continuing um, uh, stereotypes that Mormons face is, is the notion of polygamy. And so um, uh, definitely I think that's a part of our response, right? Monogamy was defined as the preserve of the white race in the 19th century, and we become uber monogamous <laughs> by, the, by the middle of the 20th century. And I think it is in, once again, distancing ourselves from those accusations. Yeah. Is there any evidence that Brigham Young or other church leaders during the time that the policy towards blacks was shifting, did they ever consider that, oh, you know, maybe we're being inconsistent or unfaithful to sort of, you know, what Mormonism started with? Yeah, frustratingly, no. Um, so you do have uh, John Taylor in the 1879 um, interview with Elijah Abel where um, he is sort of grappling with that notion, but the precedent that he's going to is Brigham Young's precedent, and frustratingly, not going to Joseph Smith's precedent, right? So Brigham Young, he says, has said these kind of things. Uh, we can't violate the precedent that is established by Brigham Young, even though Brigham Young's precedent is a violation of Joseph Smith's precedent of ordaining black people to the priesthood. So um, I do see John Taylor grappling with that question, but he's, unafra he's afraid of violating Brigham Young's precedent, um, not sort of thinking through the way in which that was a violation of Joseph Smith's precedent. And then, remember, by the beginning of the 20th century, Century, they're falsely remembering back that it began with Joseph Smith. And once you get that memory in place, that's the memory moving forward in the 20th century, and it, it sort of entrenches that priesthood and temple restriction. Uh, so you have been in the presentation talking about how open the church was beginning to all But what were the actions of the practice that you talked about? Uh, or in, uh, it's hard to get my yeah, sure. Um, and you're absolutely right. It is predominantly white. Um, absolutely. Uh, those who respond are largely from uh, native-born um, Americans or from northern and western Europe. So, uh, you know, places of, of white origin. Uh, but that's the interesting irony. In the book, there's a, there's a chapter on even those white immigrants are racialized um, uh, and, and denigrated uh, so that outsiders looking in on even Scandinavian um, immigrants coming uh, to the U.S. and suggesting that they're degraded as well. Um, so um, this fear that Mormonism is just a deterioration away from whiteness. But in terms of demographics, it's always, it, it's a small number. Um, it's really hard to get a handle on how many blacks uh, converted in the 19th century. The records uh, aren't great. Um, Orson, or excuse me, Parley Pratt, um, after the expulsion from Missouri, uh, looking back, um, especially for the expulsion from Jackson County, says, I don't know what the uproar was about. There haven't been more than you know a dozen black Mormons join our movement to this point. That's an estimate of Parley Pratt, right? Um, we have evidence of you know black saints coming in across the course of the 19th century. Uh, Native American groups also joining. Uh, but you're absolutely right in terms of demographics. Uh, 1850 census in Utah, the majority are British born, foreign born um, in Utah in 1850, and more Latter day Saints in um, Scandinavian countries than in, on the ground in Utah. Uh, so you're right, but um, doesn't negate the notion that the vision was a global um, gospel message and interest in sort of drawing that global uh, net in. Um, you know, uh, a, a mission to, to China in the 1850s, um, you know, uh, sort of this effort at spreading the gospel message worldwide, even though those who are responding are sort of reinforcing the notion that um, they are descendants of ancient Israel and it's sort of a white kind of redemption that's taking place. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, race of the church after 1978, because uh, after the uh, 1978 change, there was still um, there was still discussion. It still hinged on marriage and, uh, to a certain extent, sexual politics, because there was still um, discouragement of generational marriage that actually remarried in manuals for decades after that. 
Yeah, that's right. Um, and yet, uh, in terms of practice, uh, almost immediately um, uh, sealing uh, interracial marriages in the temple after 1978. So it was sort of this cultural kind of notion that gets passed on and does inhabit manuals and those type of things, uh, you know, that linger into the 21st century in terms of in print, but sort of uh, this notion that people from different cultural backgrounds will have a difficult time and sometimes gets interpreted as um, prohibitions against against race mixing. In practice, uh, after 1978, they are sealing uh, in Mormon temples uh, interracial people. Um, yeah, so uh, that kind of lingers. Um, uh, one Black Latter-day Saint um, seeks a personal interview with President Kimball after 1978 because she has returned uh, the first black woman missionary and she's returned and starts dating a white man and culturally her Latter-day Saint well, meaning, I'm sure, friends are telling her she shouldn't be doing that. She um, says she gets a personal interview with Kimball and he says to her, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not a sin. It's nothing to be worried about. And um, remember, uh, the race and the priesthood essay also includes that, um, I think, um, also to get that notion out, right? Um, race, interracial marriages are not a problem. Yeah. So you told the story of the mission president in South Africa inquiring as to how uh, the situation of the Zulu chief to, to you know, teach the rest of the people. Um, Obviously, in South Africa, there was a significant Dutch and British population. Do you know of, of missions in the 19th century to other areas of Sub-Saharan Africa that would have had a less substantial white population? No, um, I'm not aware of, of any, and, and Leslie um, might be more aware than I am, but I'm not aware of any other than in South Africa. Um, and, you know, so they are encountering black populations there, but you're absolutely right. Um, they are mostly missionizing amongst whites. Um, and in the U.S., um, uh, another example of the way in which, you know, they are very successful at claiming whiteness for themselves, I found a letter from uh, Northern States Mission President, uh, in the 19 teens, and he reports that there are three black families in the Northern States Mission, one in Indiana, one in Wisconsin, one in Minnesota. Uh, but the problem is we invite white investigators and they don't want to worship with the black Mormon families, and so we're losing white investigators. So he says, I've instructed my missionaries to no longer proselyte in the black neighborhoods. So once again, that move towards whiteness, right? So somehow white souls matter more than black souls, and the black souls in the Mormon congregations are preventing potential white investigators from joining because this era of segregation. And so you see it playing out that way in which they are then going to concentrate their missionary efforts amongst the white population and really successful at converting and gaining Mormonism a reputation as a white church. Yeah. So, Brian, I don't know how we're doing on time. I was just about to uh, say that we could take one more question. Okay, one more question. There was one here. Um, so, from my understanding, currently, when Revelation is to be passed to the church worldwide, it's the prophets and all the apostles meeting and unanimously agreeing that's the place God. Um, do you know at the time of Brigham Young and Joseph S. Smith who they were counseling with? Was this a decision that everyone? all the people process felt was right that the whole came and able to yeah, no, there's no indication that that kind of um, uh, meeting was taking place. I mean, obviously, um, we have Brigham Young articulating his position to the territorial legislature. It's an all-Mormon territorial legislature. Uh, you know, Brigham Young says, you know, outsiders complain that I am here dictating to you as your religious leader and as your governor. And he says, there's no distinction in my mind. Like, he doesn't care, right? Like, there is no distinction. They're legislatures and they're also apostles and elders in Israel. And they're doing God's work, and so there is no distinction um, in his mind. But it's never the, the kind of um, articulation that you're suggesting in terms of are we all unanimously agreed? And obviously, Orson Pratt isn't on board with Brigham Young's position from the territorial legislature. We know that, uh, but never an indication of a vote or a support or anything like that. It's 
votes on territorial bills that pass, but not on necessarily church policy. But Brigham Young's policy uh, for the legislature becomes, you know, the theological reason for Mormonism across uh, the course of the 19th and 20th century. Um, you said for Joseph F. Smith, the, the kind of meetings that we have access to in terms of minutes, okay, these are um, largely meetings that are being held in relationship to racial questions as a result of letters coming in. Um, there's one from uh, the Carolinas. We had a missionary who ordained some black converts to the priesthood here. What do we do about this? Right? Um, those are the kind of meetings that they're having, um, but no sense that they are seeking sort of um, a revelation or that they see what they're doing in terms of revelation. They're sort of meeting to come up with policy decisions and, and address the questions that are coming in. How do we ferret this out? Um, how do we distinguish um, a person's racial identity? Um, how much blood equals black? You know, and those are the same questions that broader American society is grappling with in the post-Reconstruction era. So I get no sense from the minutes of the meeting, right? And they're pretty stark minutes of the meeting, and the minutes that I have access to are in the George A. Smith family collection at the University of Utah. Uh, that's why I was able to get access to them. Um, otherwise, I'm sure they would have been uh, restricted. Um, so, you know, don't know what's happening uh, outside of the minutes of those meetings, but uh, the minutes that I have, nothing like that taking place in those minutes, yeah. Thank you very much for your attendance, for your questions. Please join me in thanking Professor Reed.